Now, why is it that we think that the known universe is larger than we, we can observe? Well, one point is that it's um, expanding <laughs> and we, we always see the same radiation out there, so the glow of the Big Bang. But there are some deeper reasons um, from the theory of inflation. What, the best way to explain the universe, the properties that we see, is that it's very much bigger than the piece we can see. So, for example, we measure space to be what's called flat. I don't even have to say what's called flat. It is flat. <laughs> so if you imagine slices of space, let's imagine slices of them at different times. So, so you just slice the universe and, and say, there's a big sheet, it's like this table. Okay, like a table. There's a sheet of space, and there's another sheet, another sheet. And it can, it can have a geometry, right? It can be flat, like a tabletop, or it could be curved, uh, like a sphere, or it could be curved in the opposite direction, sort of like a saddle or a bowl. And we can measure that. And when we measure it, we see it's absolutely flat. And that's a very unusual thing for it to be like, because what, what Einstein's theory says is that the, the shape of space that the curvature of space is determined by the stuff that's in it. That's, that's basically Einstein's theory of general relativity. Put stuff in space and it curves it and bends it and warps it and stretches it and so on. And what we find is that we, there's precisely the right amount of stuff in the universe to have a completely flat universe. And the, the, the explanation, the most favoured explanation for that is the universe is way bigger than the piece we can see. And so it's like looking at a piece of the Earth. Like if you look at a little one mile square of the earth right then it's it, it's flat right you have to look at big distances to see that actually you're on a curved surface and that's one of the ideas about the, the universe and why it appears to be the way that it is because it's way way bigger so we just we're just looking at a little piece and that's why it looks flat so you can define flatness so when, when you're saying flatness you're talking about it as if it's a table there must be some sort of a there's a dimension to it correct Oh yeah, there's a third dimension of space. Right. Um, the same applies. It's just a generalization of geometry. Then, so you, you can the, the point is we can picture it in two dimensions. You can quite literally, you could imagine sending light beams out, and we do this measurement actually. We can look at the the the, dist the most distant light we can see, which is something called the cosmic microwave background radiation. If you look at the Andromeda galaxy, which we can see with the naked eye here in LA, you can see that it's the most distant object you can see with the naked eye. If, as you look further out into the universe to more and more distant galaxies, you're looking further back in time because you look at something that's a billion light years away, then the light took a billion years to get to us. So you see it as it was a billion years in the past. And we can actually look so far out that we can see almost back to 13.8 billion years ago, which is very close to the Big Bang. So we can look to light that began its journey before there were galaxies. And that's the, the oldest light in the universe. That light, it turns out that there are sort of structures or ripples in that light, um, which we can use as a ruler. So quite literally as, as a ruler on the sky. Because that light's been traveling through the universe, we can see how that ruler has been distorted as, as the light has traveled through space. And so we can infer whether space is flat or curved or how it's warped, if you like, just from that measurement. And they're basically, sort of, a, I don't know, three mile long laser beams that just sit and measure the sort of stretching and squashing of space as the ripples in the fabric of the universe go through. And, and what they've been observing are collisions of black holes. So you can imagine how extreme, like a colliding black holes, it's an incredibly extreme event. So it shakes the fabric of the universe and the ripples come across the universe. And these laser beams, which are just basically rulers, can detect it. They just sort of ring almost like, you know, just vibrate as the ripples go through in space and time. Kip Thorne, who got the Nobel Prize uh, last year for this, he's one of the greatest living physicists. So he, I once saw him describe it as a storm in time. So you've got this a time storm. It's a beautiful image. <laughs> so that technology is incredible because the, the, the change in length, way, way, way less than the diameter of an atomic nucleus. A collision of black holes, the idea that you can detect that. Yeah. That the first paper they published, there are two black holes and they were about 30 times the mass of the sun each. And they were orbiting each other and spiraling in towards each other. And they accelerated. At one point, they were approaching each other at one third the speed of light. And they accelerated to two thirds the speed of light in a tenth of a second and then hit each other. 
and the explosion, the energy release was, I think I'm right, it was something like 50 times the energy release that the power of all the stars in the observable universe glowing. And it was something like 50 times that amount of energy for a tiny fraction of a second. But it's, it's an unimaginably violent event. And that's why our detectors can see the ripples that that makes in space and time. 